Hello, praise the Lord, everyone. In my personal study of the events from a medical viewpoint, I am in debt, especially to Dr. Pierre Barbet. He is a French surgeon who did extensive historical and experimental research and wrote extensively on the topic. An attempt to examine the infinite physic and spiritual suffering of the incarnate God in atonement for the sins of fallen man is beyond the scope of this discussion. However, the physiological and anatomical aspects of our Lord's passion, we can examine in some detail, what did the body of Jesus of Nazareth actually endure during those hours of torture? The physical passion of Christ began in Gethsemane. Of the many aspects of his initial suffering, on one of which is of particular physiological interest is the bloody sweat. Interesting enough, the physician, St. Luke, is the only evangelist to mention the occurrence. He says, and being in an agony, he prayed the longer, and his sweat became like drops of blood trickling down upon the ground. You can find that written in the book of Luke in chapter 22 and verse 11, uh, excuse me, verses 44. Every attempt imaginable has been used by modern scholars to explain away the phenomenon of bloody sweat, apparently under the mistaken impression that it simply does not occur. A great deal of effort could be saved by consulting the medical literature. Though very rare, the phenomenon of hematidrosis or bodily sweat is well documented. Under great emotional stress, tiny capillaries in the sweat glands can break, thus mixing blood with sweat. This process alone could have been produced marked weakness and possible shock. Although Jesus' betrayal and arrest are important portions of the Passion story, the next event in the account, which is significant from the medical, from a medical perspective, and his trial before the Sanhedrin and uh, Caiaphas, the high priest. Here the physical trauma was inflicted. A soldier struck Jesus across the face for remaining silent when questioned by Caiaphas. Uh, the palace grounds then blindfolded him mockingly taunted him to identify them as each passed by, as they each passed by. They spat on him and struck him in the face. In the early morning, battered and bruised, dehydrated and worn out from a sleepless night, Jesus was taken across Jerusalem to the Praetorium of the fortress Antonia, the seat of government of the persecutor of Judea, Pontius Pilate. We are familiar with Pilate's action in attempting to shift responsibility to her rod, Antipas, the Church of Judea, 
Jesus apparently suffered no physical mistreatments at the hands of Herod and was returned to Pilate. It was then in response to the outcry of the mob that Pilate ordered Barbas released and condemned Jesus to scorching and crucifixion. Preparation for Preparations for Jesus' scourging were carried out at Caesar's orders. The prisoner was stripped of his clothing and his hands tied to the post above his head. The Roman legionnaire stepped forward with the flagrum or flagellarum in his hand. This was a short whip consisting of several heavy leather thongs which two small balls of lead attached near the ends of each. The heavy whip was brought down with full force again and again across Jesus' shoulders, back, and legs. At first, the weighted thongs cut through the skin only. Then, as the blows continued, they cut deeper into the subcutaneous tissue, producing first an oozing of blood from the capillaries and veins of the skin, and then, and then, and finally, spurting atrial bleeding from the vessels and the underlying muscles. The small balls of lead first produced large, deep bruises that were broken open by subsequent blows. Finally, the skin of the back was hanging in long ribbons, and the entire area was an unrecognizable mass of torn, bleeding tissue. When it was determined by the Sertrian in charge that the prisoner was near death, the beating was finally stopped. Bless your name, Lord. The half-fainting Jesus was then untied and allowed to slump to the stone pavement, wet with his own blood. The Roman soldiers saw a great joke in this provincial Jew claiming to be king. They threw a robe across his shoulders and placed a stick in his hand for a scepter. They still needed a crown to make their transvesti complete. Small flexible branches covered with long thorns commonly used for kindling fires in the coracle braziers in the courtyard were planted in the shape of a crude crown. The crown was pressed into his scalp and again there was corpus bleeding as the thorns pierced the very vascular tissue. After mocking him and striking him across the face, the soldiers took the stick from his hand and struck him across the head, driving the thorns deeper into his scalp. Finally, they try their saddest, their saddestest sport and tore the robe from his back. The robe had already became adherent to the clots of blood and serum in the wounds and it's just in its removal just in the careless removal of a surgical bandage caused excruciating pain. The wounds again began to bleed. Hallelujah. Indifference to Jewish custom 
the Romans apparently returned his garments. The heavily catabome of the cross was tied across his shoulders. The procession of the condemned Christ to Thebes and the execution detailed of Roman soldiers headed by the centurion began its slow journey along the route which we know today as the Via Dolorosa. In spite of Jesus's effort to walk erect, the weight of the heavy wooden beam together with the shock produced by corpus loss of blood was too much. He stumbled and fell. The rough wood of the beam gouged into the, lacer the lacerated skin and muscles of his shoulders. He tried to rise, but human muscles had been pushed beyond their endurance. The centurion, anxious to proceed with the crucifixion, selected a stalwart Northern African onlooker Simon of Serene to carry the cross. Jesus followed, still bleeding and sweating the cold, clammy sweat of shock. The 650-yard journey from the fortress Antonia to Golgotha, Golgotha, was finally completed. The prisoner was again stripped of his clothing except for the lion cloth which was allowed by the Jews. The crucifixion began. Jesus was offered wine mixed with myrrh, a mild angelistic pain relieving mixture. He refused to drink. Simon was ordered in place to place the patellabellum on the ground and Jesus was quickly thrown backward with his shoulders against the wood. The legionnaire felt for the depression at the front of the wrist. He drove a heavy square wrought iron nail through the wrist and deep into the wood. Quickly, he moved for the other side and repeated the action, being careful not to pull the arms too tightly, but to allow some flexation, flexion and movement. The patabellum was then lifted into the place at the top of the stripes and the tillus, reading Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, was nailed into place. The left foot was pressed backward against the right foot. With both feet extended, toes down, a nail was driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees moderately flexed. The victim was now crucified. As Jesus slowly sat down with more weight on the nails in the wrist, excruciating fiery pain shot along the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. The nails in the wrist were putting pressure on the medium nerves, large nerve trunks which traverse the mid wrist and hand. As he pushed himself upward to avoid this stretching torment, he placed his full weight on the nail through his feet. Again, there was searing agony as the nail tore through the nerves between the metatracial bones in his, of his feet. At this point, another phenomenon occurred. As the arms fatigued, great waves of cramps swept over the muscles, knotting them in deep 
relentless throbbing pain. With these cramps came the inability to push himself upward. Hanging by the arms, the pectoral muscles, the large muscles of the chest were paralyzed and the intercoastal muscles, the small muscles between the ribs were in unable to act. Air could be drawn into the lungs, but could not be expelled. Jesus fought to raise himself in order to get even one short breath. Finally, the carbon dioxide level increased in the lungs and in the bloodstream, and the cramps partially subsided. As medallically, he was able to push himself upward to excel and bring in life-giving oxygen. It was undoubtedly during these periods that he uttered the seven short sentences that are recorded. The first looking down at the Roman soldiers throwing dice for his seamless garment. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. The second to the, patient, the penitent thief, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The third, looking down at Mary, his mother, he said, woman, behold your son. Then turning to the terrified, grief-sicken adolescent John, the beloved apostle, he said, Beloved, behold your mother. The fourth cry is from the beginning of Psalms 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He suffered hours of limitless pain, cycling of twist, joint rendering cramps, intermittent partial exfiliation, and swearing pain searing pain as tissue was torn from his lacerated back from his movement up and down against the rough timbers of the cross then another agony began a deep crushing pain in the chest as the pericardium the sac surrounding the heart slowly filled with serum and began to compress the heart the prophecy in Psalms 22 verses 14 was being fulfilled. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. The end was rapidly approaching the loss of tissue fluids had reached a crucial, a critical level. The compressed heart was struggling to pump heavy, thick, sluggish blood to the tissues and the tortured lungs were making a frantic effort to inhale small glumps of air. The markingly dehydrated tissues sent their flood of stimuli to the brain. Jesus gasped his fifth cry, I thirst. Again, we read in the prophetic Psalms, my strength is dried up like a pot shred. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws and thou hath brought me into the dust of death. That's in Psalms 22, verse 15. A sponge soaked in Pascha, Pascha, the cheap sour wine that was the staple drink of the Roman legionnaires was lifted to Jesus's lips. His body was now in extremis and he could feel the chill of death creeping through his tissues. This realization brought forth his sixth word, 
possibly little more than a tortured whisper. It is finished. His mission of atonement had completed. Finally, he could allow his body to die. With one last surge of strength, he once again pressed his torn feet against the nail, straightened his legs, took a deep breath, and uttered his seventh and last cry, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The common method of ending a crucifixion was by crucifracture, the breaking of the bones of the legs. This prevented the victim from pushing himself upward. The tension could not be relieved from the muscle of the chest and rapid suffocation occurred. The legs of the two thieves were broken, but the soldiers approached Jesus. They saw that this was unnecessary. Apparently, apparently, the make doubly sure of death. The legionnaire drove his lance between the ribs upward through the pericardium and into the heart. In the book of John, in chapter 19, verses 34 states, and immediately there came out blood and water. Thus, there was an escape of waterly, watery fluid from the sac surrounding the heart and the blood of the interior of the heart. This is rather conclusive post-mortem evidence that Jesus died, not the usual crucifixion death by suffocation, but of heart failure due to shock and constriction of heart by fluid in the pericardium. In these events, we have seen a glimpse of the epitome of evil that man can exhibit toward his, toward his fellow man and toward God. This is an ugly sight and is likely to leave us despondent and depressed. But the crucifixion was not the end of the story. How grateful we can be that we have a sequel, a glimpse of the infinite mercy of God toward man, the gift of atonement, the miracle of the resurrection, and the expectation of Easter morning.